Now for our story. It was dinner time in Wakefield, and Main Street was almost deserted. As Bill Mead hurried toward the square opposite the courthouse where he was to meet Peggy Douglas, he was thinking over a conversation he'd had that afternoon with Jim, the bartender at Smitty's. It had been a puzzling and rather disturbing talk. Bill decided not to mention it to the young girl he planned to marry. It was probably just a question of foolish gossip, and, well, there was no point, Bill told himself, in burdening Peggy with it. And yet he couldn't entirely dismiss it from his mind. If it was a joke, this story which connected his name with that of Carla Descari, it was certainly an unpleasant one, and probably the best thing would be to ignore it entirely. Well, now, as Bill cuts across a path toward a shady bench where Peggy is waiting, he is determined to make their evening a pleasant one with nothing to mar it. And yet, as Peggy gives him a faint, welcoming smile, it occurs to him that she, too, has some little disturbance on her mind. Hello, Peggy, darling. Hello, Bill. Been waiting long? No, I just got here a few minutes ago. Oh, that's good. Gee, you sure look nice and cool in that white dress. <laughs> like a vanilla ice cream soda. <laughs> I feel like a cup of hot chocolate. I've been over at the dressmakers all afternoon. There's nothing so tiring as being fitted. Especially on a warm day. Oh, well, never mind. We'll have a nice, relaxing evening. And what do you say we drive over and have dinner at that place by the river? Oh, the river lodge? Yeah. Oh, well, Bill, I think that'd be nice. Uh, I'll have to go home first and freshen up a bit. <laughs> I'd be a disgrace to you in my present wilted condition. You look all right to me. But if you'd rather... Yeah, I would. You sure you won't mind waiting while I shave? No, of course not. Okay, then. Let's get started for the good old Wakefield Auto Court. Hey, come to think of it, you've never seen my place, have you? Gosh, I'm glad I had a house cleaning spree last night. I must have had a hunch you'd be coming here soon. Why, this is quite nice, Bill. <laughs> the way you talked, I thought it'd be terrible. Well, it's not exactly elegant. But I don't mind so much now that I can look forward to our having a nice place of our own before long. Yes. Oh, it's going to be so wonderful, darling. Mm-hmm. Peggy, what's the matter? You sound as if you have something on your mind. What is it? Oh, it's... Nothing, really. I was just thinking of something Emily Ames said today. She the dressmaker? Yes. I imagine they're like barbers. They'll talk your arm off if you give them half a chance. Well, what would she have to say? Oh, it's probably not worth mentioning. It just made me a little uncomfortable at the time. Well, if it bothered you, you'd better tell me. Well, I'll try, Bill. But the trouble is, she didn't come right out and say anything definite. She was so vague, I wasn't sure what she was getting at. I told her we were getting married, and... You mean she didn't approve of our getting married? Well, she kept saying you may think you know a person, and then find out you really don't. And that you can't trust a man. That I should expect the worst. All that sort of talk. <laughs> oh, I know it's silly, Bill. I shouldn't have told you. Uh, it's too bad the old biddy doesn't keep her thoughts to herself. It's odd, though. I had kind of an uncomfortable session today myself. You too? Yeah, it was at Smitty's. The guy who was a the bartender there made some crack about my being a man about town or some such thing. Well, that's funny. That's what Emily seemed to think. Well, this fellow even mentioned names. Seems he thought I... Oh, it's too ridiculous even to talk about. No, Bill. Tell me what he said. Well, it was something about Carla the Scary. Carla? I know. I, I told you it was crazy. Finally, I decided he was just kidding me. But why he'd connect me with Carla just doesn't make sense. No, it doesn't. Except, though, you know, I was thinking of the other day when Mario came by the farm, remember? Yeah, sure I do. We both noticed at the time that he acted rather cold, almost unfriendly. Yeah. Yeah, that's right, he did. Oh, but good Lord Mario knows I'm a friend of his. And he knows about you and me. Yes, of course he does. Oh, let's forget about it, Bill. We're probably exaggerating the importance of the whole thing. <laughs> We're taking things too seriously. Yeah, maybe you're right, Peggy. Okay. We've got better things to think about anyway. We mustn't let what people say get us down after we've weathered things so far. We're going to be okay. I'm sure we are, Bill. But there's still one thing that bothers me a little. Now what? Well, maybe it's foolish, but I can't help wondering about Kit. Kit? Oh, 
darling, after we've agreed not to think about the past. I know, but I keep wondering what happened to her. So odd, the way she just disappeared. I can't help wondering where she is. And at that same moment, far away in Miami Beach, the young woman Peggy and Bill would like to forget but cannot, has just opened the door of her dingy room to admit her landlady. Ever since the previous day when she'd been shocked by signs of Kit's extreme mental disturbance, Mrs. Brotherton had been uneasy, worrying about this strange girl who talks wild nonsense at one moment and in the next becomes coldly logical. Now, as Kit stares at her defiantly, she says, I knocked on your door earlier, Miss Cummins. I knew you were here, but you didn't answer. What about it? What do you want? Well, I wanted to have a talk with you. Look, Mrs. Brotherton, I've paid my rent on this room. It should entitle me to some privacy. The way you're continually popping in and out, I might as well live in a railway station. If you're as dissatisfied as you seem to be, Miss Cummins, then what I have to say won't bother you at all. Well, suppose you tell me what you have in your mind and let me decide for myself. Well, the fact is, Miss Cummins, I want you to leave. Oh, so that's it. Well, I have no intention of giving up this... this dump. You know it's impossible to find quarters in this town. Besides, you have no reason for this attitude. You're all wrong about that. I have my reasons, good ones. Indeed. Well, then perhaps you'd better tell me what they are. Something funny's going on here, and I don't care to be mixed up in it. For instance, the way you acted yesterday. Yesterday? My good woman, I didn't even see you yesterday. I chose to remain here all day, and I saw no one. Absolutely no one. There. That's just what I mean. You don't even remember the wild things you said, the way you acted. Why, it was enough to scare the daylights out of a person. As I said to that fine friend of yours when I called him this Mr. Cromwell. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You mean you had the nerve to telephone Paul Cromwell? I certainly did. I wanted him to come and take you away then and there. But he didn't want no part of you. He said, she's no friend of mine. No friend of his. Oh, well, what difference? I can't afford to have such goings on. I've got my other rumors to think about. All this talk of yours about faces, voices. You must be crazy. I haven't the faintest idea of what you mean. Ah, so now it's me who's crazy. <laughs> That's good, that is. Or maybe this Mr. Cromwell was right. Maybe you're just putting on an act to cover up something. Maybe you stole that fancy car you had when you showed up here. Don't be ridiculous. How do I know what you've been up to? Maybe you're running away from something. Yesterday you told me your name isn't Cummings. Nonsense. Of course it's Cummings. Here, here, if you don't believe me, look at the initial on my handkerchief. K.C. You think I had that put on just for your benefit? Well, I don't know. You just don't look like a girl who'd come to a place like this all alone without a reason. Look, Mrs. Brotherton, this is getting us nowhere. I, I can't imagine why you consider me an undesirable tenant. I've made absolutely no trouble, demanded nothing whatsoever. And as for this talk about what I said to you yesterday, well, obviously you invented that as an excuse to get rid of me. I know how people like you work. Someone offered you more money for the room, didn't they? Well, I can take care of that. Fifteen, seventy-five, one hundred, hundred and twenty-five, hundred and fifty, yeah, two hundred. There you are, Mrs. Brotherton. It's all yours. Surely two hundred dollars ought to appeal to your, shall we say, better nature. Kit Calvert, bribing her landlady in order to stay in the shabby room to which she has retreated. Kit, whose mind veers from normalcy to a tormented world of visions and hallucinations. And in Wakefield, Kit's father, smarting under the disgrace of the daughters brought on him, has started a revengeful plan by which he hopes to discredit his ex-son-in-law, Bill Meade, unaware that while he attempts to destroy the innocent happiness of Mario and Carla Descari, his own daughter is on the verge of catastrophe.